Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder, the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound. You understand that. So I'm going to ask that you um, take just a moment of time to prepare yourself for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound. That means confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9. And uh, with that in mind, I'll uh, give you about uh, 15 or 20 seconds or so to uh, pray. Uh, keep short accounts. It doesn't take long. Just name the sin. That's it. Immediate forgiveness. So with that in mind, uh, you bow your heads and close your eyes up and um, pray, and I will close out our prayer time and write in the study of God's word. Father, we praise you for uh, the privilege of coming to you today with the word of God and goodness gracious. There's never a day in, uh, a day on the planet where it's been needed, needed more than today uh, for the surroundings, the things that are going on all over the earth. And by golly, when you look and see what's happened with the, with the coronavirus spread all over the world, we do know this. If we understand your word, and we do, what we understand is this, you are in control of the circumstances and you could have stopped this coronavirus had you wanted to, but you have a plan for that. And it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's not good on our part. Uh, those of us who love the word of God, love you, are actually suffering by association, but for others, you're gathering their attention with the pressures of life. So what we want to do, those of us that are on Facebook, those of us that are on YouTube that actually, uh, and WebEx, and actually those of us who understand your word from beginning to end of human history, we're going to praise you for all that you're doing for us and others. Listen, Father, we know that you are with us. You are abiding with us. You are going to comfort us in our, in our time of need. You have given us the means of doing that. The question is whether or not we're going to trust your word. So with that in mind, Father, we lift up the entire planet to you today and ask you to uh, be merciful toward us and um, be gracious toward us. And we will do the best we can to live your life for the salvation of the lost and for the edification of the saved. I pray this in Christ's name. Before I forget, Father, yes, one more thing. I'm going to pray for Miss Joyce Blackwood. I will offer a special prayer for her in just a moment in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me make a couple of announcements. First of all, Miss Joyce Blackwood happens to be housed right now. Just a moment here. Miss Blackwood has, happens to be housed in Briarwood Nursing and Re Rehabilitation Center in Little Rock, Ar Arkansas. It just so happens that several people in that uh, rehabilitation center have contracted coronavirus and Miss Blackwood is one. Miss Blackwood is, uh, has been tested positive for the coronavirus and I will ask that you lift her up in prayer. Uh, she is a magnificent, magnificent lady of grace. She is actually teaching a Bible study uh, in the past recently. She's taught a Bible study until she's been isolated now because of the virus. But uh, you lift her up and lift those folks up at, um, at Briarwood Nursing and Rehabilitation Center, Ms. Blackwood specifically, and uh, then you can offer prayer for others as you desire, okay? Let me pray. Father, uh, you have seen and known the life of Ms. Joyce Blackwood for nearly, uh, nearly 90 years. And this is a woman of faith. It's a woman of, uh, it's a woman of grace. And uh, she is suffering by association now. Uh, she, didn't, uh, she didn't do anything to contract this. Uh, this is suffering that's undeserved. We'll study about that. We understand that. But it's undeserved suffering for her. But I know that your grace is sufficient. And I know she knows that your grace is sufficient. So I lift her up to you and those at, at the rehabilitation center and ask 
for your abiding grace for them in Christ's name. Amen. Now, uh, from what I understand, most recently, since last night, late last night, Miss Blackwood is um, uh, recovering. Uh, her fever has broken, so we'll just leave that in the hands of the Lord, and we'll keep you updated uh, as we can. Now, the next week, was actually, we're going to study Ephesians 3, 6, and 7 today, but uh, I need to make an announcement that our uh, Bible, uh, Bible class fellowship luncheon at the American Pie Pizza next Sunday has been suspended, canceled until further notice. Uh, we'll go back to that just as soon as we get to Claire, okay? Now let's go to our let's go to our study. There's nothing needed more than, a, than the study of God's word. Now look here. Okay, so we're logged on to watch the study of the word of God. We need to realize, as I indicated on Facebook this morning, there's more to the Christian way of life than just getting saved. Listen, if you're saved, you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. But the question is, what are you going to do between now and the time you die or now and the time the, the, the rapture occurs? What is your responsibility? Every person online with me today, on Facebook, YouTube, WebEx, those of you who are online, if you're a born-again Christian, you have a responsibility before God, and that responsibility is, in fact, to be a minister of reconciliation. No matter who you are, you have a ministry of reconciliation. Now, what that means is you're going to take the gospel message to those people that you have contact with. Now, you're not going to cram it down their throat. What you're going to do is look, look at the situation, evaluate the situation, and follow the leadership of the Lord. What we don't need to do is we don't need to keep our mouth shut when the opportunity arises to share the word of God to those people who are in need of salvation. And lo and behold, when you look at what's going on out here in society today, there's never been a day better to try to understand what is wrong with my life. That's the people you're talking to out there that haven't been saved. What is wrong with my life? Guess what? We have an opportunity to display a, the life of Christ through our, through our lifestyle, what we think, what we feel, what we say. That's that there's overt activity. And when people look at you and say, my goodness, we've got things that are horrible going on here and you don't seem to be upset about this. We don't have to be upset because God is in control. Let's go back to our verse now, because what we're going to do this morning is uh, if you haven't been with me in a while, I'm going to give you some information that perhaps you've never heard before. Perhaps you have heard it, but don't understand it. And this is simply a, a, an opportunity in your life to realize there's more to the Christian way of life than what we have thought there was, what you thought there was. And here's an opportunity for you to begin to catch up. Now, watch this. Let's review the first five verses. Here's what Paul said. He's talking to the Ephesians. This letter is circulating throughout the Roman province of Asia. We have just, uh, we're, we're just two years short of the time when Israel is uh, the Jews are going to be driven out of Israel under the fifth cycle of discipline for the third time. And in 70 AD, two years after Paul writes this letter, actually two years after his death, this is six, uh, the uh, eight years after he wrote this letter is when Israel will be driven out of the land. When Israel is driven out of the land, God moves the agenda away from Israel and the Jews to Gentile client nations. And the United States of America is a client nation under God, and we have a responsibility. Every one of you online with me, whether you're only here one time, a half a dozen times, or never again, you need to realize that as a born-again Christian, God has a pivot of mature believers on this planet and has a pivot of mature believers in the United States of America. And when the pivot shrinks, because we as Christians fail to be responsible to God, and, and as a part of a, the client nation, we have a responsibility to evangelize the lost. We have a responsibility to teach the word of God to the saved so that they can grow to spiritual maturity. We have a responsibility to be a haven for the Jews, and we need to be responsible to send out missionaries to the Gentile nations of the world so they can be evangelized in this angelic conflict that's a battle between God and Satan. 
Now, if we fail as born-again Christians, if we fail as members of the body of Christ in this client nation, God will do the same thing to the United States that he did to 12 other nations, including Israel. And that is to drive them out of the land, is to destroy that national entity, and another nation will rise up because they're positive toward the teaching of the word of God. Now, with that in mind, here's verse 1. Paul says, for this reason, that's going back to, to Ephesians 2, 18 through 22. And Paul says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, Paul is in Rome, he's in, in, under house arrest in Rome at this time. Why has he been arrested? Not because he did something wrong, but because he did something right. He's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Then he says he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. See, Jesus Christ commissioned Paul to go to the Gentiles because the Jews had failed for years and years and years. Hundreds of years, uh, they, they had failed. So Paul is raised up by Jesus Christ to go to the Gentiles. Then in verse 2, he said, if indeed, and that word if is a first-class condition and means if and it's true. He said, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, what Paul is about to tell them is, look, you know, you know what I'm about. You know what my ministry is about. I've I'm, I'm been commissioned to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, and it is true that you have heard about this. You've heard about my ministry, and we're going to find out why they, or how they've heard about it, and it's because he had briefly written to them on previous occasions. So he said, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, and you have heard, which was given to me for you, God had raised, God through Jesus Christ has raised up Paul to go to the Gentiles with, a, uh, with the gospel of Christ. Then he said, look, here's how I received that. Here's how I received this information. He said that by revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. Now, this is the truth right here, the mystery, the mystery doctrine that is failed to be being taught in many, 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 many churches across this, across this nation. The mystery here is not something, oh my, let me see. Mm -hmm. God has revealed a mystery. I wonder what that is. The mystery here isn't something that can be understood. It can't be understood. The mystery here is information that heretofore had never been taught. They knew nothing about this mystery truth that Paul is going to reveal and was revealed to him. Then he goes on and says that by revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. And it's these mystery doctrines, these mystery truths that should be being taught to born again Christians in this client nation today. So he said that by revelation, this, this mystery was made known to me as I wrote before in brief. Paul had, had briefly talked about this. Then he goes on and said, by referring to this, what is that this? This is the letter. And here's what he's saying. By referring to this letter that I'm sending you right here, you're reading it. When you read, now he's talking to a pastor because this letter is being sent by Paul from the Roman prison to the Roman province of Asia, and this is going to be distributed and passed among the pastors. Now, here's the issue. The pastor is not going to get up and read this letter to the congregation. What the pastor is going to do, he's going to get this letter. He's going to consider what is written. He will exegete every word so that he can communicate clearly to the congregation exactly what this mystery is all about. So he said, by referring to this letter, when you pastors, when you read, when you exegete this letter, here's what happens. When you exegete it, you can, in fact, understand my insight into this mystery of Christ. And he calls it the mystery of Christ because that, that word out there is a genitive that means ownership. Jesus Christ owns this doctrine. Now we move into verse 6. And here's what verse 6 says. He said he's talking about the mystery. Then he says that the Gentiles are joint heirs. See, prior to the, prior to the time that the age, the age of grace came into effect, the Jews were in charge. They had, the, they had these truths, the law, the Mosaic law, Codex 1, Codex 2, Codex 3, that they were living by. But guess what? They had treated the, the Mosaic law as ritual without reality. They were missing the point that everything they were seeing in the temple, everything that they were hearing from the, from the, uh, the priest was pointing to Jesus Christ. 
It was not just a ritual, but they were pointing to the one who's going to come, be born of a virgin, die on a cross, be buried and resurrected on, for salvation on their behalf. Now, with that in mind, he said that the Gentiles are joint heirs. The Jews were looking down their nose at these Gentiles. Why, they don't have the law. They don't have the privileges that we have. They don't have a land. They don't have this. And hold it just a moment. So they're looking down at their nose at these Gentiles. The, the Gentiles, as far as they are, they're just dirt. And the Jews were no more than snobs. They were not born again. They were racial Jews needing regeneration. And this is why God dispatched them in 70 AD because of their failure. So he said that the Gentiles, that's you and me, that God has raised the Gentiles up to be joint heirs. Everything that we are heir to that God has provided, we are now on the same level of the Jew. The Jew is on the same level of us. So if you are in the body of Christ, you are joint heirs with the, with the Jews. He also, you are fellow members of the body. The body is the body of Christ. It's the body in which every born-again believer enters at the moment of salvation. So as far as the Jews are concerned, we are fellow members. If the Jew is saved, if the Gentile is saved, we are, we are in the same body of Christ. We are also joint possessors of the promise, the promises that God has made to the born-again believers. We're no longer looking up to the Jew and say, oh, I wish I had some of that. No, right now we have been elevated by salvation to the same plane as Jesus, as, uh, as the Jew. Now, he says, uh, he said, and joint possessors of the promise in Christ Jesus. See, in Christ Jesus is the means by which you become a joint heir, a fellow member of the body, a possessor of the promise. Everyone who is born again is in the body of Christ, and we share all those things. Now, here's what I want you to consider, because what we need to understand is what is this Christian way of life? Is it just going to church? Is it listening to a sermon? I don't understand what he's saying, but oh, I love the music. I love the, I, I love the, the gospel message. I love the old hymns. I love to sing in the choir. Oh, I have such fellowship in my Sunday school class. Is that what the Christian way of life is all about? Not really. All of those things may be good, but that's not the center of what the Christian way of life is. So let's consider what God has done in 70 AD by raising the born-again Christian up on the same level of the Jew, if in fact the Jew is saved. So what we're going to do is consider this. In your notes, let's take a look at the age of Israel. In the age of Israel, the Jews had the Mosaic law. The Gentiles were without the law. And as a result of that, the Jews were very snobbish because they thought, wow, look what we have. And these people over here, they don't have anything. Realizing at the same time that when a Jew went into the temple, you came through the outer gate. You went through the, the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Jew went through the dividing wall into the, into the innermost part of the temple. And guess what? If a Gentile went through that went through that barrier, that that barrier wall, guess what? They would be killed. That's how bad it was. So the Jews were very snobbish. They were all, well, we're privileged here with God. These Gentiles don't have what we have. Well, that's true, but the Jew was supposed to evangelize the guy who was out there. And if he gets saved, he becomes a Jew and he can go in there. Isn't that amazing? So the Jews had the law, the Gentiles didn't. So we're looking down our nose at these Gentiles. Now in the age of grace, in this second column over here, in the age of grace, that's now, for the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles are on the same level. We see here that the Jews and Gentiles are joint heirs with Christ. We are fellow members of the body of Christ and we are joint possessors of the promise. Now watch this, as we go down here, we're, to, we're going to talk about what it, need, what it means to you to be a born-again Christian more than just going to church. And many people, listen, one of the reasons why I am on the internet today is because, because um, I saw so many people leaving the church. That I've, and, and why were they leaving? They were going to church. They were singing the songs. They were going to, to Bible class. They were, but they were walking out of the building saying, what in the world was the benefit of this? I didn't get anything. 
there was, there's not the kind of teaching that will help somebody learn how to live under every circumstance of life. So I've indicated to you that the goal of the Christian way of life is not salvation. That's only the beginning of the Christian way of life. So as you're advancing, look at this diagram here now. Look, find the cross in your notes or on the screen. Find the cross right here. Right here's the cross, okay? That's where you begin the Christian way of life. But there's a flat line after that cross that says babyhood. That's where you are when you come into the Christian way of life. You are a spiritual baby. You may be 50, you may be 80, you may be 100, you may be 20, you may be 16. But when you come into the Christian way of life, you are a spiritual baby. Now, once you have enough doctrine, once you have enough understanding of the Bible, the pertinent truths, the pertinent truths that relate to your spiritual growth, you begin to move out of babyhood into what we call spiritual adolescence. You're in spiritual adolescence because you now know more than what you did when you became a born again Christian. Now, if you become a born again Christian and never get the never get anywhere where the word of God is not being taught, guess what? If you get saved at age six, when you die at age 106, if you live that long, you're still a babe in Christ. You're failing in your responsibility as a born again Christian. And by the way, you don't have to listen to me. There are there are other other people, there are other men, not many, but there are other men who are actually teaching the kind of truth that I'm teaching here. What you need is this kind of teaching, whether it's from me or anyone else, you need the roadmap to be able to get to spiritual maturity. So you go from salvation into babyhood, advancing to adolescence, and then you see this, this, this bold black line right here. The bold black line is diagonal. That's when you break into spiritual adulthood. And when you reach spiritual adulthood, we're going to use the term super grace blessings, super grace. I'm going to show you why we're calling that super grace in just a few minutes. Now, here's the issue. If your pastor's teaching the word of God and using a different term, that's fine. Here's the issue. Behind every one of these terms that I will give you this morning is a biblical concept. You need to understand the concept, whether you agree with the term or not. So I'm using the term super grace blessings. As you are advancing in the Christian way of life, not because you're getting older, but because you're getting wiser in your understanding of the word of God, you will go from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual maturities. And see, that's what this is. This line here says super grace blessings. When you arrive at this level, you are in spiritual maturity. You've gone from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual maturity. When you are in spiritual maturity, you are you're beginning to be occupied with the person of Christ. So that when your feet hit the floor and do you go to bed at night and go to sleep, you are occupied with the person of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you get you close your eyes and you're looking and just you, you visualize Jesus in your head and you say, oh, my, I can't I can't leave here. I, that's not what occupation with Christ is. Occupation with Christ means you're thinking like he thinks, you're feeling like he feels, and you're doing like he would do in every circumstance of life. Remember, we are fighting a spiritual battle on three fronts. We're fighting the world, we're fighting, fighting the flesh, and we're fighting the devil. You can't win this thing on a consistent basis until you make it to spiritual maturity. So when you re reach spiritual maturity, this is where there are certain blessings that come to you simply because you have the capacity to receive the blessing that God is going to give. Now, if you are not capable of handling the blessing because you're a baby Christian, you're an adolescent Christian, God will withhold that, withhold that, uh, that blessing for you until you reach that level. And if you never get there, you will miss that blessing in time and miss the reward in eternity. That's how serious this is. Now, let's talk about the spiritual blessing then of super grace, reaching spiritual maturity. What do you get? What does God have for you? When you go through babyhood, adolescence, and finally reach spiritual maturity, here are the blessings that God has waiting for you. He's waiting to pour. He's had these blessings since eternity past. He divinely decreed these blessings in eternity past on your behalf. 
His omniscience has seen every opportunity you've had in time from the time you're born till the time you die. He's seen every opportunity. And as a born again Christian, every opportunity has a blessing with it. If in fact you follow through doing the right thing in the right way with that opportunity. So what are the kind of blessings that you that you receive when you get to spirit when you get to spiritual maturity? Here they are. First of all, there are spiritual blessings. What do you mean by spiritual blessings? What that means is when you by the time you reach super grace, by the time you reach spiritual maturity, those terms are synonymous. When you reach maturity, when you reach super grace, the blessing of spiritual blessings come sharing the perfect happiness of God. Circumstance of life, whether it's good, bad, right, wrong, indifferent, horrible, magnificent, no matter what the circumstance, you are able to be happy inside. You are internally, you are happy in your soul and you're not falling apart. You're not complaining. You're not griping. You're not belly aching. Why? Because you know, and I know that God is in control of the circumstance. Now, what that means then, when you get to when you get to super grace, when you get to spiritual maturity, and you see all that's going on out here in the world, do you realize how many people have lost their job because of the coronavirus? Do you know how many people are in the hospital? How many people have died as a result of the coronavirus? Do you know how many? How about this? You never thought for a moment. Two months ago, you never thought for a moment that you couldn't buy toilet paper. Amazing, isn't it? So now we're scrambling for toilet paper. We're scrambling for this. We're scrambling for uh, for uh, uh, hand sanitizer. You're you're uh, amazing. You go to you go to the store. You go to the store. There's no meat left on the counter. There's no there's no lettuce. There's no what. You get the picture. Now what happens? You go to the checkout line. You got one item. You got fifteen on fifteen on your list. You missed fourteen because they're not there. You get to the counter to, to pay and check out, and you complain because there's no food. What? No, hold on now. This is what the Christian way of life is all about. See, as a born again Christian, if you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit, that's not Holy Ghost stuff. You you need to understand that when you're functioning in the sphere of the spirit, that's where you, that's where the power. For, for doing the right thing comes. It's, it's where the power is that when you do the right thing in the right way, you receive the blessing. Now watch this. When you reach spirit, spiritual maturity, doing the right thing in the right way, you share the inner happiness of God. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think God's happy? Yeah, he is. The, listen, his happiness is perfect happiness. And guess what? Because you reach spiritual maturity, that blessing is awaiting you. It's awaiting me. It's awaiting every born again Christian and also occupation with the person of Christ. What that means again is by the time you get to spiritual maturity, guess what? You're thinking like he thinks, you're doing like he do, does, and, you're, and you're, uh, you're feeling like he feels. What's another spiritual blessing? Super grace capacity. In other words, when you get to when you get to spiritual maturity, God designed in eternity past for you to for you to have the capacity for the spiritual blessings that you're going to receive. We call that super grace capacity. Now stop and think with me for a moment. I indicated to you that as you're advancing in the Christian way of life, I don't know any way possible that if you wanted to buy a car and you wanted to know how this thing ran and you wanted to get in and drive down the street and go off into the sunset. But before you can do that, you have to know every part of that car and how it functions. Well, I'll tell you what, you look at it, knowing that you have to know everything about that car for you to be able to get in the car, turn on the key, put it in gear and drive down the highway and go off into the uh, go off into the sunset. Now, this is an illustration. If you had to know everything about that car, you stand and look in that car isn't going to get you in that car and, and get you off into, into, into the sunset. You're going to have to learn everything about that car. Now, Steve Haynes is on with that chaplain. Steve Haynes is on with me today, and he's the, he's the automotive kind of guy. And I, when, he, when he and I talk about that, listen, he is over my head. I don't have a clue. I sometimes don't know how to get the hood open. That's where I am. Well, that's where many Christians are in, term, in terms of study, understanding the word of God. You, you're looking at, oh, the Christian way of life. It is so wonderful. It's so marvelous. Well, that's looking at your head. 
But when you look at the circumstances of life and you're failing, 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 and not able to handle this, where you have this inner happiness, where you're occupied with a person of Christ, listen, my desire is I, 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 I am passionate. I, I groan inside for people who want the truth, can't get it, don't want it. Uh, not reaching where to find this happiness, contentment that God wants for us. It's there, folks. It's there and it's available to everybody. So super race capacity. What are we talking about? Capacity for spiritual blessings. What happens is this. If I look at this, if you have a thimble, a pint, a pint jar and a and a and a gallon jug, a thimble, a pint and a gallon. Do you realize if you're going to pour water in those? that each one of them had a different capacity. The thimble has a small capacity. The pint glass has more. And the, and the, the gallon jug is the biggest. It, hold, it holds everything. Now watch this. Super grace capacity. God has the spiritual blessings for you. He wants to pour those blessings into your life. But he cannot and will not pour until you reach the point where you have the capacity to be able to receive them. Now, if you if if you all you have is a thimble, God's got God's got a bucket load He wants to give you, but you don't have the capacity. How in the world do you get capacity? Capacity is resolved. Capacity is built by an understanding of the Word of God. So, super grace capacity. This is the capacity of a mature believer to receive spiritual blessings. So, the word capacity actually refers to the amount of something. That you, someone, can produce. Well, let's take a look at this. The question for all of us is this. What is your spiritual capacity? And I left a blank there. I look, uh, each one of us can fill that in. What is your, what is your capacity to produce mm, whatever? So what is it we are trying to produce in this Christian way of life? So let's use some illustrations. First of all, what is your capacity to produce and experience the spiritual life? Well, I've got, I'd like to have that, but I don't know how to get it. Well, first of all, you have to be saved. You have to be clean before the Lord through confession of post-salvation sins. You have to be functioning in the sphere of the spirit. And you have to be doing the right thing and doing it in the right way. Now, guess what? All of that builds capacity to receive spiritual life, spiritual, spiritual, spiritual blessing. What is another capacity? What is your capacity for agape love? What is agape love? It's your capacity to be able to, to be to be able to handle the entire human race, to love the entire human race. This is not friendship love. This is the kind of love that when somebody persecutes you, when somebody lies about you, when someone hits you in the face, when someone does something else mean and ugly and bad to you, we have to have the capacity to allow them to function in the freedom of their life while God is handling our circumstance, giving us what we need to handle that. So love is a relaxed mental attitude toward the, toward the world. Now, here's the issue, though. If somebody actually violates your freedom, there is and must be a consequence. Freedom is the most fundamental principle of all of human history. Without freedom, we can't function in the Christian way of life. We can't worship as we desire. We can't, uh, we can't study the word of God. We can't be evangelists. We can't teach the word of God. Freedom is the most fundamental principle of all of human life. So we need, to, we need to learn to handle people out here who are hateful, mean, uh, unkind, uh, criminal, etc. But remember this, when they make a bad decision, justice comes through the law. We don't take, we don't take God's... Uh, we don't take God's responsibility in dealing with those people. We deal with ourselves under all in that kind of condition. And this is what the Christian way of life is really all about. So as you grow in Christ and you break the maturity barrier, you move into spiritual maturity, guess what? You begin to have capacity then for the experiential spiritual life. You have capacity for agape love. You have capacity for inner happiness. And, the, and the, once you break into spiritual maturity, you begin to understand and have this inner happiness. The inner happiness is based on the foundation of the word of God that you that you learned as a baby 
Christian, as an adolescent Christian, now you've broken into, into spiritual maturity, you now have a thimble full of inner happiness. You have the capacity for a thimble full. But we're going to talk about how you get more than the thimble. What's another capacity? A capacity to produce an appreciation for grace. An appreciation for grace. You see, everything about the Christian way of life has already been done for us by Jesus Christ. He went to the cross and died for our sins. You believe that, and he saves you for an eternity. He provides grace for you after salvation. That means God's plan after salvation doesn't, doesn't depend on you coming up with a plan. The plan's already there. What we have to do is find out in the word of God what the plan is and execute it. An appreciation for grace. Grace means God's provision, not your provision, not my provision, but God's provision. We find out what that is and we move on with it. Now, remember this about capacity. Remember that your capacity for life, your capacity for love, your capacity for inner happiness, your capacity for appreciation of grace is determined by the amount of doctrine you have risen in your soul. That's why when you take a look at what's going on today in churches, in, in the bodies of Christ, I'm not being listen, I'm not being critical. I'm being objective. I'm a, I'm analyzing something. Why are I'm, I'm editorializing now, not focusing on you, but my question is why are you unhappy? Why are you miserable? Why are you, why are you failing? Why isn't why don't you have the happiness that God wants you to have? Well, without doctrine you can't do that. You have to understand the principles of God's word the promises of God's word, the doctrines in God's word, the techniques in God's word, and you have to understand the rules of living, hold it, hold it now, the rules of living, that is the mysteries that Paul is talking about. You don't get these mysteries in the Old Testament. You don't get the mysteries in the Gospels. You don't get the mysteries in the first nine chapters of the book of Acts. We don't understand the mysteries until we read the 13th epistle of the Apostle Paul. There's where we get our there's where we get our information by which we live. Now, let's move on from there. Here's a, a, another thing. See, what we're talking about up here is super grace capacity. Now we're coming down to point number three. When you reach super grace, you reach spiritual maturity, guess what? You now have the capacity, you have the ability to face undeserved suffering in life. And remember this. That once you break into this into spiritual maturity, God's plan in the resolution of the angelic conflict is to indicate that now you have enough doctrine when you reach spiritual maturity. You have enough doctrine now. So what he does is he's going to sit send each one of us through a series of tests. Listen, if you're going to bulk up, if you're going to get stronger and you're going to exercise, you don't get stronger by by sitting down and looking at the weights. You're not, go, you're not going to get, you're not get, going to develop stamina if you just go out and walk three steps and sit down. See, it costs something. Uh, uh, life is not free. So if you're going to, if you're going to handle undeserved suffering, what do you mean undeserved suffering? If you've lost your job, do you think you did anything wrong to lose your job because of the coronavirus? No, you're suffering by association. If the economy goes south, you didn't do anything. You're working for, for a living. But now, guess what? You can't buy what you used to buy because you don't have enough money. That's undeserved suffering. So what you want to do is to take a look at your life and ask yourself when you find yourself under pressure and you're suffering, ask yourself, did I cause this by something I did wrong? Did I violate God's plan or did I not? Or if you understand that you're clean before the Lord, you're doing the right thing in the right way. Now what you say is, Lord, I now understand why I'm suffering. I didn't deserve this. I don't, didn't earn it. But I'll tell you what, Lord, I will be strengthened by this because I'm going to trust you and your word in this situation. And guess what? Every time you do that, you gain, you gain spiritual strength. Then in point number four, super grace blessing. When you reach super grace, you now have the ability to, listen, you now have the ability to correctly interpret contemporary history. That means, that means you looking out right now today, and you look at all that's going on in the world today, with Russia, with China, with Vietnam, uh, with uh, uh, North Korea. You look at what's going on in Cuba, what's going on in Venezuela. Look what's happening in Arkansas. Look what's happening in the United States. Look what's happening in Italy. 
Look what's happening around the world. You now have the capacity to interpret contemporary history. And I can tell you where we're going. I can tell you where we're headed. We're headed for the rapture and we're headed for the tribulation period. Seven years are the most, the, the worst years in human history. We're headed for that. Now, how, how long is it going to take to get there? Uh, that's in God's hands, not mine. This is what, well, listen, we're leading up to that. It's one day at a time, one day closer. How long is it? A week, two weeks, a month, a year, a decade, a century, a millennium? I don't know how long it is, but I can tell you this, that when you, when you look at human history, because you understand enough of the word of God, you learned it in babyhood, you learned it in adolescence, you, you're learning it, continue to learn it in spiritual maturity. When you break through into spiritual maturity, you don't have it all yet. That's why you have to grow, go on then into the third area of spiritual maturity. So hold on just a moment. You have the ability, when you break through into spiritual maturity, guess what? You have the ability to correctly interpret contemporary history. So when that happens, and you understand what human history is about, and you understand the Bible, you're going to understand you don't want communism in this nation. You don't want socialism in this nation. You don't want a form of religion that is out to kill you and destroy the Constitution of the United States and take control of the world. Excuse me. You're able to, you're able to understand contemporary history. You're able to understand what's going on. And that's why when we study the Word of God, what we want is a biblical worldview, a biblical worldview. This is happening. This is happening. That's happening. I wish I understood that. Well, look here. The Word of God gives you information and solves every problem on, in life. God saw that in eternity past, his omniscience, and he provided through divine revelation. That's why we have a completed canon of scripture. How about point number five? Freedom from slavery to circumstances of life. Oh, I just, I just can't get out of this rut. I can't get out of this rut. I can't get out of this rut. You have freedom from slavery to the circumstances of life. What was wrong in your life? What's going on in your life? What do you, what, what is your, I want to use the word addiction, but I don't, I, I want to get away from that for just a moment. Addiction is one thing. But you're a slave to your certain, I can't do, I can't do anything else. I've done this all my life. And I, excuse me, where's that getting you? Where's it getting you? So when you reach spiritual maturity, you have enough doctrine to be able to be free from, the, from slavery to the circumstances of your life. And guess what? And you're able to adapt to changing circumstances. Well, here, can you, can you adapt? Uh, are you going to go crazy because you can't buy toilet paper? You got to, you have to adapt to the changing circumstance. That's just one thing, but that's so clear. That's so clear. Adaptability. Point number six, we're talking about spiritual blessings. Grace orientation. Once you reach spiritual maturity, you have enough doctrine to realize God's in control. It's his plan, not mine. See, that's grace orientation. Grace orientation means you're looking for his plan not yours or not somebody else's. You have freedom orientation. You're not looking to be bound. Listen, communism, socialism, Marxism, all of these forms of government. We are, listen, we don't have a democracy in the United States of America. Our founding fathers gave us a constitutional republic. We're not governed by man. We're governed by law. We're governed by law. And when you understand the Constitution, if the, if the federal government, if the state government, if the county government, if the local government is violating the Constitution, and you need to understand that every servant in government from, the, from, the, from the, the city that you live in, all the way to the federal government, takes a, con takes a, no a constitutional oath to abide by the Constitution. And I can tell you right now that those in Washington, D.C., there are very few that are, and people like you and I are help letting them do this because we don't have the courage to stand up and tell them that's wrong. And when you understand the concept of nullification, you are the final authority in what constitutes constitutionality. See, grace orientation, freedom orientation. I want to be free. You want to be free to worship as you desire to study the Word of God, to send out missionaries, to be friends and, and, um, and, and assist, uh, protect the, the Jews who are scattered throughout the world. That's a biblical concept. 
You're going to function under authority. And listen, the authority orientation, authority orientation. That means you're go, you're going to be you're going to function under the authority of God the Father, His Word. You're going to function under the, under the authority of your parents as a child. Your wife, you're going to function under the, the authority of your husband. Uh, you're going to function under the authority of your boss. You're going to function under the authority of whatever, wherever you are, whatever the guidelines are, you are under authority. So the question is, are you going to function under authority or not? But when you reach spiritual maturity, guess what? You now have the capacity to function under authority. You're not bucking authority all the time. And if you don't like what you're doing, go someplace else, see? You have, the, you have that right to do that. You're free. Another part of, of this uh, capacity is common sense. Common sense is, is you, we, have, we have the mind to be able to figure things out. And when you're figuring these out, common sense means everybody is seeing this the same way. But today, common sense is not so common. Then the last thing here in spiritual blessings is a total sense of security. A total sense of security. Whether it's your spiritual life or your physical life, you have a total sense of security, whether in prosperity, times of prosperity, or times of times of uh, disaster. Where you know we're sort of in a time of disa disaster now in the country and in this world. Question: Do you have a do you have a sense of security? This is what the Christian way of life is all about. Now look here, we talked about there are seven things there. Those are those are simply spirit. Um, these are spiritual blessings. Let's come down here now and see temporal blessings. When you reach spiritual maturity, God has wealth. Whether it's received or acquired, it's legitimate wealth, okay? You have professional prosperity. What does that mean? Professional, pros um, professional prosperity is, is great influence, great influence where you are, great leadership, capacity for success, promotion, recognition in your sphere of life. Now, there, there's a principle here. And the principle is simply this as far as professional prosperity is concerned. See, we're talking about worldly things, okay? Here's the principle. When God promotes you, not your boss, not somebody else, but when God promotes you, you are qualified for the job. How about professional prosperity? What characterizes professional prosperity? It's characterized by the ability to assume responsibility. How many people today are, they have a responsibility, but they're failing in the responsibility. See, as a born again believer, moving towards spiritual maturity, when you reach there, guess what? You have learned to be responsible in all that's going on. And you are actually able to assume authority. And to assume authority means you're down here, you're, you, you have, you're about to get promoted, but when you get promoted, there's gonna be a lot of authority that you have to guide things. So what happens is as, as a part of professional prosperity, when you are promoted and God promotes you, guess what? You have the ability to handle the responsibility that's given to you. So you assume that responsibility without emotional inspiration or no, please, please, I, you can do it, you can do it. No, without emotional inspiration and without pseudo motivation, some false motivation. There is also, as far as the temporal prosperity is concerned, there is social prosperity, social prosperity, and that's characterized by having great friends, not just friends. This is characterized by having great friends. Now, I, listen, as I look, as I look down this line right here, I wouldn't trade any one of you. I wouldn't trade any one of you for a billion dollars, for a jillion dollars. I wouldn't trade you for anything. Why? Because I consider you a great friend. I am blessed by your friendship. So what we look, what we're looking at, this not friends. These are great friends. Miss Joyce Blackwood. I mentioned her. Or mentioned her earlier. Uh, great friends with that lady since 1970. I am in. I am in Little Rock. I'm listen. I'm in Maumel, Arkansas. Since night, I've been in Arkansas since 1970. I am here in Arkansas because God led 
Mr. Mr. Dub Blackwood and Miss Joyce Blackwood in the North Maple Baptist Church as a part of leaders there to invite me to come into Arkansas to be a pastor. I'm here because of that lady. So I consider her a great friend. I look down this list, every one of you, even though I've never met some of you face to face, I know who you are. I trust you. You are a great friend. That's part of my, that's part of my social prosperity. Sexual prosperity for those of for those of you who are for those of you who are alive. Sexual prosperity is characterized by sexual pleasure. Sex is pleasurable, so it's characterized by sexual pleasure pleasure with one spouse, and that excludes sex uh, same sex marriage. Mental prosperity is characterized by the ability to think. You have increased concentration, the ability to concentrate. Cultural prosperity, characterized by maximum enjoyment of drama and art and music and literature and history. Establishment prosperity, establishment, the divine establishment principles, freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, free market capitalism and employment. Establishment prosperity is characterized by enjoyment of freedom, enjoyment of privacy, enjoyment of protection of life protection of your property from criminals and protection protection from reprisal. Now let's take a look at some, some definitions. Here's some definitions. As you're growing in Christ, I've indicated the terminology is, is not, it's not important that everybody use the same terminology that I do, but there are biblical concepts that must be understood. And when you're trying to understand that biblical concept, when you go down to spiritual Murfreesboro and you're going down deeper into the Christian way of life, you're going to find some things down there that aren't named. The concept is not named. So you're going to give it a name so that when you teach it, the people that you're, you're teaching will understand that. And then the next time you come back, I just say the word and don't have to take 30 minutes to explain what I explained last time we were together. Terminology. So let me give you some definitions of some terms. We're using the term super grace. What does super grace mean? Super grace is the status of spiritual maturity. So when you go from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual maturity, you have reached super grace. Now there's a reason why we're calling it super grace and we'll see that in just a moment. Super grace is greater than grace. Do you understand that? There is, there's something about super grace that's different from grace. So what we need to understand here is, first of all, that spirit, super grace actually means spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity means super grace. So those are synonymous terms. So when I use the term super grace, you know I'm talking about spiritual maturity. If I talk about spiritual maturity, you know that I'm talking about having reached a level of spiritual growth to where you are in the mature bracket. Now, how about ultra super grace? Okay, so you got grace. Super grace. Now, whoo, now we got ultra super grace. Well, what is ultra super grace? Ultra super grace is a term that defines a that describes a concept where ultra super grace is the most advanced stage of spiritual maturity. See, there are stages of maturity. For example, in physical life. I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's 18 now or 21. There's an age in which you're considered an adult and able to buy cigarettes. You're able to buy alcohol. Oh, you're an adult. Okay. But the truth of the matter is, you are an adult only by definition where someone says you're an adult by age. But physically, you don't become a mature, a mature human being until you reach about 28 or 30. And the truth of the matter is, you don't become intellectually mature until you reach about 40, 50, 60, or 70. Depending on depending on what kind of education you have, and I'm going to talk about formal education. It's what kind of education you have. Life teaches you. So ultra super grace is the most advanced stage of spiritual maturity, related to time, related to human history, and related to the angelic conflict. So the issue is, uh, when we get to maturity, we reach super grace, but we're looking for that ultra super grace status, and there's a reason why. We are in the angelic conflict and you can't resolve the conflict if you don't have the wherewithal to do it. Now there's another term, surpassing grace. What is surpassing grace? Surpassing grace 
is the term that is used to describe the rewards received by a spiritually mature believer in eternity. See, God has rewards for you in eternity. He's blessing you in time. But based on those blessings, you will be rewarded in eternity. So we have super grace. We've got ultra super grace. Now we've got surpassing grace. Super grace blessing, ultra super grace blessing is in time in human history. Surpassing grace is the blessings that you get when you receive when you go to heaven. Now, here's the issue was uh, regarding super grace, uh, su surpassing grace blessings. If you become a spiritually mature believer in time, that's now in this life, the rewards that you will receive in eternity are classified as surpassing grace rewards. So if I'm talking about rewards, I'm talking about surpassing grace rewards, you know I'm talking about something you're going to receive at the beam of seat of Christ, okay? Point number two here, the term super grace, at, where do you get that term? Where do you get that term super grace? Well, see, super grace actually comes from James 4, 6. And the, the use of the term, James says, greater grace. Look at that verse. In James 4, 6, he says, he, God, he gives greater grace. Well, look here. If he's giving greater grace, there must be a lesser grace, okay? So greater grace is actually going to define and describe a, a portion of grace, a provision of God that's beyond just grace, okay? So he said he gives greater grace. Therefore, God, watch this, God is opposed to the proud. He's opposed to the proud. You know what that is? That's not humility. A proud person is someone who's functioning on their own energy. It's my plan, my human viewpoint plan. Oh, God, I don't know. God's plan isn't working. No, I'm going to go with this one. See, God is opposed to the proud. Now, what that means is you're going to get an attention getter. Angelic conflict. You're going to get an attention getter because you're not following God's plan. He wants us in his plan, but guess what? He allows you to be free. That's why your, that's why your volition has two poles, positive and negative. Positive pole, I can go with you, God. Negative pull, ha, I don't want you. I'm going this direction. I like this over here better. So he gives greater grace. For those of us who reach spiritual maturity, there is a greater provision, a greater blessing awaiting you and me. And that is out there in eternity at the beam of seat of Christ. Now watch this. Greater grace. Greater grace? See, here's where it is. Greater grace is when you reach maturity. But how many how many understand the various their various categories of grace for example going down this list right here right here before the cross before you were saved there are three there are three different kinds of graces before save and it's salvation one is common grace common grace means god has a provision he has the same provision for every person on the planet to receive the gospel of christ if you want the gospel of christ there is nobody that god says no you can't have it Gentile, you can't have it. I'm a Jew, I got it, and you can't have it. Now, see, everybody everybody has the capacity. They had the capacity back in the Old Testament. Common grace is God's provision that to let everybody come to a knowledge of, the, of the, the Jesus on the cross, his life, okay? Efficacious grace, that's the next kind. Th these are in order. First common grace, then efficacious grace. Efficacious grace is under common grace, you get the, you get the word of God. You get the gospel, you believe. But you as a, a depraved human being are believing the gospel of Christ. So the Holy Spirit actually makes your salvation effective. He makes your belief effective so that you can be saved. That results in saving grace. But now you're on the other side of the cross. Now you have logistical grace. Logistical grace is actually the grace provision that God has for you to be able to get. The, for example, in life. If God has a plan for your life and you don't have any food, you'll last for a little while, but you won't you won't achieve God's plan. You won't achieve it, achieve his goal for you. Therefore, God has some spiritual provision for you and I to be able to reach greater grace. He he's not telling you you have a responsibility to grow to grow to maturity, but I'm not going to provide the way to get there. I'm not going to do that. No, logistical grace is his provision all the way spiritual maturity so you got common grace efficacious grace saving grace logistical grace and guess what greater grace that means greater than the four that we just mentioned
down in point three, we're about time to close here. God is pursuing us. Listen, God is pursuing you. He's pursuing me. Said, no, wait a minute, just saying, I'm out there looking for God. I can't find him. He's out of the, he's got to be out there somewhere. No, 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 no. He's pursuing you. He's pursuing me as a born again Christian. God is pursuing us. And the very fact that God the Father is pursuing spiritually mature believers. See, he's pursuing us. Why? He has blessings he wants to give us. But we've got to get there. We've got to get there. And when he finds us, guess what? He, he not, he's not looking for us in the sense that uh, he doesn't know where we are. But he's pursuing us. He has something he wants to give us. But we've got to turn around and accept it. So God is, in fact, pursuing us. The very fact that God the Father is pursuing spiritually mature believers, we will, we will call this pursuit, we're going to call this pursuing grace. God is pursuing us. Now, here's the evidence. Evidence that God is pursuing spiritually mature David. If you're spiritually mature, he's going to, he's going to pursue you. Here's what he said. David's writing in Psalm 23, 5, and we'll close. He said, you, God, you prepare a table before me. Where did you do that? You did this in the presence of mine enemies. See, God has something there for David. He is wanting to give something to David. David's got to reach out and take it. He said, you, God, you have anointed my head with oil. My, my cup, he said, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us. And that word bestowed, that word bestowed there is he has pursued us to the praise of the glory of his grace. He has, he has pursued us in the beloved. What does that mean? It means only in the beloved. You have to be a born again Christian to receive this. But as a born again Christian, you're going to grow to spiritual maturity where in fact, he is pursuing you, pursuing you, pursuing you to give, to give, to give. He wants to pour. But he can't pour till we get there. Well, let's stop right here. Listen, folks, I can't believe this. It's amazing. I want to thank all of you who are here. This is the first time I've had an opportunity to do this. Let me just share who's online with us here on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, Donna Hayden, my daughter. Sandra Malone from Hot Springs. D Don Neiman from here in, uh, in Little Rock. Uh, Sandra Malone, yeah. Uh, Sandra Malone, yes, out in, uh, in Hot Springs. Uh, Louis DeCastro from... Uh, Davao City Mindanao, Eddie Gallo from Las Vegas, Blaine Carter from out in West Little Rock, Donna Camp from Green uh, from Greenbrier, Judy Blackwood from, and Ford from uh, from Little Rock. Uh, let's see, uh, Bobby Davis from Little Rock, uh, Sherry Butler. Sherry, I'm not really sure where you're from. I know you, but I'm not sure where you live. Nellie Hickiana from uh, from Santa Maria and uh, Mindanao. Joe Hurley from um, from um, uh, oh just. Uh, I'll be back. I'll get there, Joe. Just saying. Uh, Marion, Marion Bonds. Marion, I'm not really sure where you live. Marion Stevens, not sure. Sue Davis, so so glad. I think you're out in Hot Springs also. Hope, sir, I guess you hope. Thank you so much for being on with us. You're actually in uh, Conway, I believe the area. Uh, Galen Gallo, that must be Las Vegas. Uh, let's see. Mary Jo Lamuco from Dallas City, Mindanao. Uh, Gina Smith. Uh, Gina, I'm not sure where you're from. Thank you for logging on. Robert Rice is actually from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Connie Absher, Connie, I think you're up in the uh, up in the BB area, something like that. Uh, Mary, jo yeah, let's see. Julie Hess, I'm not sure, Julie, where you're from. Bill Morgan, God bless you. Uh, you may be down in uh, Birmingham, in that area. Tony, Tony Carrick, a beautiful, beautiful young lady, is a server. I call her the greatest server in all the world, and she serves uh, and uh, cleans tables as a busser at American Pie Pizza here in Maumel. Marilyn Thornhill, Little Rock. God bless you, um, Marilyn. Uh, Alex, Alex, when uh, roll rate, Alex, and I'm not sure where you're from. Are you the Philippines? You may, you may be in uh, Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure where you're from right now. Uh, Donna Reynolds. Thank you, Donna, from, uh, uh, from, um, yes, uh, blank. Okay. So, uh, a member of uh, Brad, uh, Brad West Church. Okay. Um, uh, Mary, Mary Lewis. Mary, I'm not sure where you are, probably traveling. Stephen Bonds from Fayetteville. Josh Kerr, thank you, Josh, from, uh, from BB, Arkansas. Uh, Ruby and Angela Harris from, uh, uh, from California, God bless you. Nellie Hickiana, yeah, from uh, Santa Maria. Aaron Davis, Aaron, I'm not sure where you're living. 
Uh, but uh, God bless you for being here. Uh, Marco, thank Marks for being with us. Uh, Rowena Hopfinger, I think you're up in the in the Illinois area around Chicago. Uh, Justin Boyd, uh, Justin, I think you're out in, uh, in Fort Smith, Arkansas. God bless you. I believe you are a representative here in the state of Arkansas. Thank you, sir. Uh, Amanda, Amanda Melusa, uh, uh, Bob, um, Amanda Lowry. I'll leave that. Let her pronounce her last name. Rocky uh, Rocky Chanko is from Las Vegas. Uh, John Payton, Payton, John, I'm not sure where you're from, but God bless you for logging on. Sandra Swaffer from here in Fenton. Uh, Alvin es Espera, I'm not sure, Alvin, where you are, but God bless you and thank you for being with me. Uh, let's see, and the other two here, uh, Gina Smith is with Marilyn Thornhill. Um, it's her daughter. God bless all of you and thank all of you for, on Facebook, for uh, WebEx for logging on. Listen, I realize that you've logged on because, because of coronavirus. Uh, I don't expect you to stay with me. You're welcome to come in anytime I'm available. Uh, Sunday night, uh, Sunday morning, Monday night, Wednesday night uh, on Facebook and WebEx and recording on YouTube. So God bless all of you and thank you for being with me tonight. Uh, see, Pastor Michael is uh, with us this morning also. Uh, we've got a great group of people on, on, on WebEx. Look, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I'll be back tomorrow night. God bless all of you. Father, Bless these people. Bless them. I'm asking you to do that. Be merciful to us as we wade through this period of human history. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and good day.